Good afternoon. All right, may I, will everyone please stand? Good afternoon and welcome to the meeting of Rotary Club of Seattle number four. Named for being the fourth oldest club in the world and also one of the largest. I'm Beth Knox, your club president. As we convene today, we respectfully acknowledge all right, figuring that out there. We respectfully acknowledge that we do so on unceded Coast Salish land, specifically the ancestral land of the Duwamish, Suquamish, Stillaguamish, and Muckleshoot tribes. This acknowledgement does not take the place of authentic relationships with indigenous communities, but serves as a first step in honoring the land we are on. We acknowledge and pay respect to the first peoples who gathered here, to elders past and present and to all indigenous peoples. Today kicks off Black History Month. President Barack Obama said, Black History Month is about the lived shared experience of all African-Americans and how those experiences have shaped and challenged and ultimately strengthened American, America. Now our main program today is an annual favorite, Rotary Business Mentors Program with the University of Washington. This is a program supported by the donations you made to Seattle Rotary Service Foundation. Now, I recently read that we not only benefit from having a mentor, but we could actually use five kinds of mentors. Number one, the master of craft to help you be the best in your field, the person who has wisdom or experience and can function as your personal Jedi master. Number two, the champion of your cause, someone who will talk you up to others and who has your back. Number three, the co-pilot, the colleague at work who can talk you through projects or listen to you vent over coffee. Number four, the anchor, the colleague or friend or family member who is your confidant and sounding board when you hit a speed bump or are going through uncertain times. This person keeps your overall best interests in mind when you're setting priorities. And number five, the reverse mentor. We often conjure up the image of an older person or teacher when we say mentor, but the counterpoint is also important. Learn from the people you're mentoring. Ask for their feedback on your leadership style or engage with them on current events and trends to maintain a fresh perspective. Now here at Seattle Four Rotary, we enjoy music, singing, and words of inspiration to kick off our meeting. Leading our music committee today is, Pat, is Linda Ruff, who is joined by Bill Center. And following the music, I invite Jaime Mendez to share our inspiration for the day. Linda and Bill. One step at a time. Yeah. You need mentors even when you're old, I'll tell you that. <laughs> no matter what stage of life you're going into, you've never been there before and you can benefit from the wisdom of those who've gone before and done it well. And we've been lucky to have a lot of people like that in this club for many years. And I thank you all. Good news, we're singing a song everybody knows. Okay, uh, bad news, no piano, no guitar. If this was an aerial act, we'd say we're working without a net. But uh, since it's musical, we'll say we're a cappella. But to inspire you with my mediocre voice, I'm gonna sing solo the introduction and you'll know when to come in as we sing God Bless America. Mm -hmm. While a war is raging far across the sea, let us pledge allegiance to a land that's free. Let us all be grateful for a land so fair. As we raise our voices in a solemn prayer, God bless America, 
land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairie to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. God bless America, my home sweet home. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jaime. It's always an honor and a great pleasure to share the invocation. It's, uh, I really appreciate it greatly. So I'm going to start this off with a quote. And um, it goes, pain of choice is power. Pain of circumstance is suffering. Pain is mandatory in life. Suffering is optional if you choose to stay. An easy way this quote can, um, relates to me and everyone here is that we had an upcoming assignment. Whether it's a test, business proposal, or presentation, there will be pain to study or prepare properly. But before it's due, the circumstances depend on the amount of effort usually reflects on the outcome. I believe everyone has the choice to be powerful on a daily basis. It can simply start when we woke up today. As we sat on the edge of our bed, Right before we start our routines, we said something to ourselves. The weather might not be ideal. The big test is on the horizon. The same old injury might be still lingering. And yet, we can choose to start the day by saying to ourselves, today is going to be great. I'm going to put my best foot forward no matter what the obstacles are known or unknown presents itself. I like to tap into my inner JFK. We do these things not because it is easy, but because it is hard. So everyone, please continue to choose to be powerful, even when it's hard, because it benefits not just you, but all of us around us. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jaime, and thank you, Linda and Bill. That was amazing. We appreciate you setting the stage for our meeting today. Uh, now we have uh, actually, I'm gonna. We have our greeter today. We had uh, Jorge and John. Thank you for doing that. Uh, and our meeting reporter for the day is Dan Mead Smith. Now I wanted to give you a quick update on our uh, Rotary Club director, John, our search. So uh, last week, the job posting closed for the position, and we ended up with a sizable group of applicants. I'm very excited about that. And I want to acknowledge the invaluable support from club members, Virginia McKenzie and Jevin Powell, who have both donated time and their talent and professional services to lead the search committee. Virginia, thank you. Jevin, I know you're online. Thank you for that. Uh, now, yes, thank you. Now, Virginia brought her executive recruiter skills to the table and stepped up to screen all of the applicants to determine the top candidates to move on to the interview process. Jevin is an organizational psychologist by profession and brought his leadership development skills to the table to craft a polished interview process. And then board leaders also stepped up to conduct interviews over the next two weeks with the candidates, after which the finalists will move on in the process for second interview with Nancy Cahill and I before the top finalist is selected as our new club director. So the second phase uh, that is led by uh, past presidents, uh, Jimmy Collins and Jeff Bork and Kim Moore. 
Uh, now, I'm incredibly uh, grateful for all of you who have donated your, your time to support this search. Now, we have several uh, number of guests who have joined us here today. I'm going to uh, start with Will Tuttle from uh, University of Washington. If you could stand as I call your name, then we'll recognize all of you together. Uh, Dechelle Henderson, Alicia Ng, Adam Grupp, who is a guest of Virginia McKenzie, Paul Shepard, guest of Jennifer Honstein who, with Boeing, uh, Tom Garland, guest of Tracy Garland, Andrea Black, guest of Fedva Dickman, and Deb Robinette with Tacoma Rotary Club. Welcome. I, want, I have one other group that I want to recognize. Uh, there's a lot, so I'm just going to ask you all to stand. I'd like to just recognize all of the University of Washington students who are here attending with us. Can you all stand as well? All right, thank you for being here. Now, I am very excited for this next, next segment for two reasons. Number one, our member spotlights have returned and our featured member today is none other than the wonderful Fedva Dickman. We're excited about that. Now, the second reason I'm excited is because of the return of our spotlights mean our presenter has returned as well. So please welcome, fresh off several month recovery from back surgery, co-VP of membership, John Steckler. Well, fellow Rotarians, honored guests. Uh, yes, as, as mentioned, as, after an unfortunate and unavoidable absence on my part, I'm now back. And uh, I am so excited to present you with this month's Rotary Spotlight member. Uh, spotlight member brings, this particular Spotlight member brings such light and excitement to every committee she works on and to every event we are so lucky to share with her. It's true, the Rotary Spotlight member for the month of February is none other than Fedva Dickman, classification, real estate retired. Uh, she's what we call a champion member as she's been a member of Seattle Rotary for over 10 years. In fact, she's been a member of Seattle Rotary for over 20 years and she's been a Rotarian for over 33 years. Now, Fedva's life has been filled with an international feel since her birth in Mardin, Turkey. Look at that little but cutie pie. <laughs> Family has always played a strong role in Fedva's life. She has two brothers and one sister. And today, one of her brothers, and one of her sisters is here with, uh, with us today. We welcome you. We thank you for being here to honor Fedva. Thank you. <laughs> now, Fedva's mother was a homemaker. Her father, who he held many jobs, such as a translator, because he spoke five languages, he was a photographer. He had a business changing gauges of gold and silver for jewelers. And he was even a tour guide. Let's see if I can. Fedva's dad was an inspirational and powerful influence in her life. And although born in Turkey, Fedva's family had no Muslim blood in them uh, as American missionaries came to Turkey and converted her grandfather to a Protestant minister for 40 years. Now, here's a fun fact. Fedva's grandfather made sure to give all of his children names that you couldn't tell if they were Christian or Muslim so as to avoid any discrimination. Fedva's grandfather had six children, five boys and one daughter, and being a big believer in the importance of education, he sent all of his children outside of the country for college thanks to help from the Americans. The only son not to go to America was Fedva's dad, who stayed behind to take care of the grandparents and his own family. Again, inspiring Fedva and becoming a role model in sacrifice and work ethic. One uncle was a very successful in Tulsa in the oil business. He invited the grandfather and Fedva's dad to come over and uh, visit them in 1953 with the intent of moving the entire family to America. But <laughs> unfortunately, it didn't work out. The entire family had to move from Istanbul to Mardin. Now, the family only spoke Arabic at home, not a word of Turkish. So when Fedva started to attend school, she was unable to communicate until she learned the Turkish language. She completed her entire education, including all the way through the university. Now, there are only three universities in Istanbul and Fedva applied to the University of Istanbul. She was interested in becoming a chemist. Now, as you expect, it's pretty darn competitive when you got 100,000 students applying for 10,000 applications. And luckily Fedva was one of those 10,000 students accepted. And during her first year in college, Fedva was, well, she was what they referred to in Istanbul as, um, I think they call it a, a party animal. Yeah. 
See, she had a drinking problem comprised of too much Turkish coffee and a love of American movies. That's a deadly combination. Her sister told her she better clean up her act if she ever wanted to get a college degree and move to America. Well, Vedva did clean up her act. She graduated with a degree in geography and a minor in sociology. Now, after college, Vedva played for a year, which a lot of people do, but what she really wanted was to come to America. In 1970, she applied and got accepted at the University of Washington for a master's in geography and environmental science. Now, her English wasn't very good, so her advisor assigned her to a Yugoslavian professor. And the two of them did not get along as a Yugoslavian professor was not a fan of Turks and or female students. Fedva realized that discrimination crosses all borders and can reach across the sea, even to America. She completed her degree and followed her sister to the University of Wisconsin, where she did research in environmental studies. And in 1976, she followed her sister again when she was accepted to a faculty position at the University of Washington in Seattle. Now, it's 1976. Fedva desperately needs to decide what she's going to do with the rest of her life. So after reviewing her skills and taking count of the marketing opportunities, Fedva decided to become a travel agent. She completed travel school. She went to work at the University of Travel. Next, she went to work at a small Black-owned travel agency that focused on the Black consumer market in Seattle. And once again, Fedva came face-to-face -face with the challenge of discrimination. Now, Fedva had no problem dealing with the Black market, but the <laughs> the black market had a problem working with a funny little white woman with a weird accent. So Fedva had to go. Well, next she went to work for Hermes Travel Agency. At first she thought the name of the agency was Herpes Travel, but then she realized that was just a language barrier. Slowly, Fedva was building a substantial consumer base, thanks in large part to her contacts at the University of Washington. And finally, in 1980, she was making enough money to open her own travel agency and... And... Dickman Travel was created. The agency grew and grew as Fedva had convinced her brother to move in from his job as an electrical engineer at Boeing to take control of the wholesale travel segment. She took control of the retail division. At the agency's height, she employed over 70 people and Fedva was living the high life, which included such perks as, oop, got a little problem here, come back. There's a great story with the little friend there in the white, anyway. Uh, such perks as playing volleyball and sharing a cocktail with James Bond's Pierce Bronson, astronaut Buzz Aldrin, Ted Danson from Cheers, and many, many other celebrities. But then came the expansion of the internet and the tragic 9-11 attacks and two major influences on the demise of the travel agent. And finally, in 2002, Dickman Travel had to close its doors. Now, at the same time, Fedva was hit by a taxi and suffered numerous complications. It was a real low point in her life. But Fedva, Fedva's a fighter and a survivor. Influenced by her family, she reinvented herself in the real estate industry and had a long and successful career with Windermere Real Estate. Fedva joined Emerald City Rotary in 1989 uh, and then left in 2002 due to her injury and loss of income. <laughs> she joined Seattle Rotary in 2008 and all in, she's been a Rotarian, as I mentioned earlier, for over 33 years. Her perfect attendance in Seattle Rotary is a testament to how special this club is to her. In short, Fedva loves Seattle Rotary. She loves the people. They are her friends. And she's always felt accepted at Rotary. Having experienced discrimination in her life, this acceptance is something that Fedva values very highly. And she has served on numerous committees and she was also the Commodore of the Seattle Rotary Mariners. She, uh, she had a little trouble finding the right size hat, but she did a great job. <laughs> How are you doing, sailor? You new in town? Okay. Uh, and she also has a long and impressive 41-year career with the Washington Athletic Club, where she met her good friend, Doug Sato. Look at that. A little picture of Doug Sato when he was a young man. Look at him. Look at Doug. Dang, nabbit boy. You are, you are a magnet. Wow. She served on their board for two terms and in addition to service, serving on numerous commissions. Now, one of her greatest passions is sailing. She loves being on the water. She also loves yoga, bicycling. She's ridden the Seattle to Portland three times, as well as numerous other rides and many, many 10K runs as long as they offer free t-shirts. Now, of course, she still has her love of travel. She enjoys traveling with her friends. And hopefully this spring, Fedva plans to return to her birthplace in Turkey. 
Now, although we're all really happy that she could find her way home, we're so glad she found her way to us. Ladies and gentlemen, my honor and pleasure to introduce our Rotary Spotlight Member of the Month for February 2023. Fedva Dickman, if you would stand up, classification, real estate, retired. Thank you, John. That was awesome. And congratulations, Fedva. We love hearing all those great stories. Now we're going to move on to our main program after which we will have time for Q&A. And uh, our roving microphone handlers are Sarah Weaver to spot questions here while Ken Grant will monitor the Zoom chat for questions. Uh, now we are, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our the one who's going to lead the program today. Uh, will is the director of Washington uh, state programs at the Consulting and Business Development Center at the University of Washington Foster School of Business. Will has two decades of experience in economic development, and through the center, they've developed a model that is being replicated in 13 cities across the country. This partnership with Rotary 4 has served as a foundation for how the Foster School supports our students and the small business community. The partnership between the Consulting and Business Development Center and Rotary 4 has helped create more than $315 million in new revenues and 250,000 new jobs in underserved communities. Please welcome Will Tootle. Thank you, Beth, for that introduction. Um, and, and thanks again for inviting us back to, to showcase our Rotary Business Mentors program. This is quite the honor. You know, it's, it's no secret that we here at the Foster School have had a longstanding relationship with Rotary 4. Uh, you know, as we have Rotarians serve as mentors for our students as they work with companies, particularly small businesses across the Seattle area. What you might not know is that this year is a, a pretty large milestone for us because we're celebrating our 25th anniversary of this partnership. So thank you, Rotary, for, for the partnership and all the support that you've given to us. In fact, what I want to do before starting anything is to invite all the Rotarians that have served as a mentor for us, past or present, over the last 25 years to please stand and be recognized so we can thank you properly. Thank you, Rotarians. Over the years, we've had hundreds of you serve, and we really support, uh, we really thank you for your support and dedication. Um, the other, the other thing I want to do is I want to thank our co-chairs. So um, starting with Terry Van Nostrand, who's actually joining me today. So you're going to hear from Terry in a second, but Terry is one of our co-chairs. He's been a, a long-standing co-chair. Terry, um, more than a decade at least, maybe 15 consecutive years. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you. And then also Paul Sai. Paul, please stand. Paul's our other co-chair today. This is uh, Paul's first year as, a, as our co-chair, but he served as a rot rotary mentor for us over the last five years. So thank you both for your leadership. Thank you for your support and dedication. Really appreciate it. You know, just uh, for those who are unfamiliar, I want to give a quick overview of what this program is like and how it serves our community. Essentially, what we do through our Rotary Business Mentors Program is we have student service consultants for, for small businesses across the greater Seattle area. We typically work with companies that are in underserved communities. So that typically includes minority-owned businesses, women-owned firms, veteran-owned companies, and in companies in sort of inner city, economically distressed areas. And as Beth mentioned, because of the work that we have done, we've helped these businesses generate more than $315 million in new revenues and 250,000 jobs across the Seattle area. So quite the impact, very tangible. And again, we could not have done this without uh, the support of Rotary. Uh, this year, we're working with 16 firms. We're going to hear from one of those businesses today. Um, we've, we have about 80 or so students working with these companies, and we have about 60 or so professional mentors helping our students through these projects, about a quarter of which are from Seattle Rotary. And as part of our mission, obviously, we want to provide an enhanced learning experience for our students. You've met them earlier today. But I think this program really exemplifies just how much we do that. And to further showcase this, I've asked to show a video that talks about our students' impact. So please.
I would say that working with the center. Excuse the technical difficulties. Glitch in the matrix. I would say that working with the center has given me a lot more confidence in my professional skills. And not only that, but it also opened, opened my eyes to uh, a possibility of a career um, in uh, consulting. Having that opportunity to work with the technology consulting program was super helpful. Getting to research in deep into the new technologies, really learning how to manage client expectations and actually just how to work with a client in general. I think that there's no chance in the classroom that you're going to be able to get this level of experience. My experience in the Board Fellows program really taught me that uh, participating as a board member is an opportunity to really influence the strategy and apply everything that you know about business to tackling um, difficult challenges that organizations face. My client was a um, nonprofit organization uh, called Helping Link. And they worked with um, the Vietnamese American community. I get the opportunity to actually work with like real world clients. I get to do all this research that I would have never done in any of my business classes. So it was awesome getting to kind of become a more of an expert in that field. There's no chance that you're going to be able to go to a classroom and get this level of something that you can put on your resume, something that you can talk about in interviews something that's going to be like real world experience for you. Participating in experiential opportunities at the center has given me a lot of practice and being able to do that and feeling confident. So don't get me wrong, I had a great experience um, in the classroom at Foster, but I would say um, the experiential opportunities made the experience so much richer. I would say that these opportunities have made the biggest impact on my college career. Without these opportunities, I don't think that I ever would have been able to be in the position that I am to get the job that I'm getting. It's one thing to like learn the theory, but it's very different to be able to apply it. I'm a hands-on learner and I truly believe that there are some uh, some insights and some, some lessons that you really can't learn unless you're out there doing the job and uh, experiencing it for yourself. So 25 years is quite the accomplishment in terms of our partnership with Rotary. So on, on behalf of the Foster School of Business, the Consulting and Business Development Center, all of our students and our small business community, we just want to say thank you to Rotary for, for the all, all the support that you've given us over that time. So thank you again. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce our, our panelists who are with us today. First, we have on my far left here, uh, Deshelle Henderson. So Deshelle is the CEO of Citigroup Solutions. Uh, Citigroup Solutions is a Seattle-based certified DBE and MBE. Uh, they provide post-construction cleaning, dump trucking, hauling, street sweeping, snow plowing, and other construction support needs. Deshelle, thank you for being here. If anybody's in construction and they need post-construction cleanup, please reach out to Deshelle before you leave today. Uh, next, we have Alicia Ng. Alicia is a student here at the Foster School of Business. She's a junior, uh, double majoring in business administration and international studies. Last year, she, consults, she consulted AD and Sons Transportation Group, where her team formulated recommendations to help the company leverage their certifications as a minority-owned and veteran-owned business uh, to secure government contracts and finance acquisition for physical assets. So, Alicia, thank you for being here. And then finally, as I mentioned, we have Terry Von Nostrin. Uh, Terry is the Executive Vice President and General Manager of Level Capital LLC. Level Capital provides vertical financing to builders and investors for the construction of pre-sold or spec single family homes, townhomes, and small multifamily projects. I, I mentioned earlier that, that uh, Terry has served as a co-chair for the Rotary Business Mentors Committee for more than a decade or so, but he's also served as an advisor for our students since he started Rotary over 20 years ago. And so again, thank you, Terry, for, for all of your support over the years. 20 years. That's a lot. That's two decades, you know. You don't look a day older. <laughs> I'm expecting 20 more years from you, Terry. In fact, I'm going to start. I'm going to start with you on the first question. I like answering or asking this question from all of our Rotarians every year because it's a surprising just how different everybody's answers are. But Terry, can you talk about you know um, what motivates you to come back year after year since you've done this for so long? Well, that's guys, hear me. You know, that's an interesting question. Uh, when I was uh, presented with the idea of joining the Mentors Club 20 years ago, I just joined Seattle Four. I was a member of other clubs, and I jumped at the idea because I've always said the 
philosophy of giving back. And as a Husky alum, I thought, what a, what a great opportunity to give back. So, uh, but I was going to mention, you don't have to be a Husky alum to, to really enjoy what the mentors program presented. That's right. <laughs> well, there was a jab in there about something south of the border, but I wasn't going to go there. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Terry, for sharing that. And, and clearly we can see that your motivation hasn't waned and we expect more from you in the future. So, uh, Dechel, um, you have a great story to tell on why you started your company as an African-American owned business, as a women owned business in the construction industry. Can you share your company's journey and how this program sort of helped shape your growth strategy? Yeah, so really quickly, I'm glad you guys opened up with music. I love, that's my, my, my passion was to be a singer, okay? But that wasn't <laughs> paying the bills, so I appreciate that. Um, so how it started, you know, I had my experience in corporate America, you know, administrative customer service background. Um, and my husband was just starting a street sweeping and dump trucking company. And so I kind of stepped in, you know, he was doing private jobs here and there. I said, you know what, with my background, I feel like I can take us to the next level um, on government projects, washed out projects. So with no background at all, I did my research. You know, I, I made connections in uh, the construction industry with prime contractors and eventually got us from two trucks to 10 trucks. Um, but I did not want to be the face of his company. <laughs> Um, you know, I was pretty much doing all the administrative tasks, you know, I, I, with my connections in the construction industry, I said, you know what, I want to do something for myself. Um, I saw that there weren't very many African American women at all, um, on any of the sites that I visited, um, any of the rooms that I were in, you know, that I was in. And so I figured, let me tap into a scope that's not saturated with so much competition. So it was post-construction cleaning. And um, again, no experience. I, I leaned on YouTube, um, you know, just learning as much as I could, going to different programs, learning about bonding and insurance and all the requirements. And I would always go to networking events um, and, and seek out mentors. And so finally, I, I met um, who's now the vice president of um, Hensel Phelps, Shannon Gustine, uh, in 2019, she gave me an opportunity. She says, you know what, we'll find you the right opportunity. So she just happened to also, along my journey, sponsor me for a program, the Ascend program with UW. And so I got my opportunity in 2020 when COVID hit. It was an unfortunate time, but it sprung me into business. I was servicing seven school sites around the clock for sanitizing um, on, what was it? The Sound Transit Operations Maintenance Facility Project. I did that post-construction cleaning. And once I got into the UW system, you know, I had no college background. I was just, you know, a, a girl trying to make it. And so I noticed that there were so many other programs um, within the UW's Foster School of Business. So I took part in the consulting program because I wanted to, keep my employees active because with post-construction, it's just project-based. And I said, you know, I have to grow my business. I have to keep them working. They're loyal to me. So I want to give them something to stick with. And um, with this program, it just, it was life-changing because I said, you know, I, I'm leaning on you students, you kids and you advisors. Uh, Jevin was one of my advisors. Um, so they really helped me map out my business plan with um, going after janitorial work which since the program, I will now be doing the American Express Lounge at SeaTac Airport. Um, that's just one of my projects. So it's been a success with this program. So thankful for it. That's wonderful to hear, Dishel. <laughs> it's ama amazing what kind of growth you've experienced in the short amount of time you've been in business. I mean, and, and going through a difficult time, as we all know, over the last couple of years. Congratulations. And know that this is just the beginning. We're going to be with you all, all, all throughout the time. Um, Alicia, I'm happy that you're here to share your experience because as I talked about, one of the missions of our center is to help advance student careers after they graduate. So could you kind of talk about what your experience was like and maybe how this helped you improve your professional growth? 
Yeah, I mean, just starting off from a personal standpoint, um, I'm a daughter of immigrants and a first generation college student. And so having the opportunity to work with a black owned, veteran owned, and especially a family owned business was everything to me. It meant everything to my team. Um, so that in itself was one of the biggest reasons why I chose to join the program in the first place and was one of the most rewarding parts. Um, with that as well, I think from a professional standpoint, um, there's a, a really rare opportunity with this program to um, kind of start and finish a, a, a program or a, a project from the beginning of a quarter to the end of a quarter. Um, that's not something that we get to do very often in business school because uh, especially with quarters, you know, it, it's so fast paced that you're moving on from one thing to the next. So being able to work with the same group of students, the same group of mentors and a consistent client from start to finish um, was a huge learning opportunity for me. Um, and it's definitely something that's had a huge impact on me um, after finishing the program, going through the rest of my college education, and I think beyond after graduation as well. Great. Could you talk a little bit more about the program that you did and maybe what role did your mentors play in helping you develop recommendations? Yeah, so I was part of the 445 class last winter. Um, like Will mentioned, my client was called AD and Sons. They do transportation logistics um, and they bid on government contracts and things like that. So um, understandably, that whole industry was completely foreign to me and my team before we started the project. And so um, there's a huge learning curve for us in the very beginning. And I think that's where we leaned on our mentors and kind of uh, the support from the community as well. Um, to say that our project was crowdfunded is definitely an understatement. Uh, we definitely sourced help and expertise from a number of um, businesses and uh, nonprofit partners that the center works with. And so um, that was pretty invaluable to the success of our project. Um, from the mentorship side as well, um, I think there's one example that I can give that kind of highlights the impact that our mentors had on us. So one of our mentors, his name is David. Um, he, uh, during that project, he actually went on a three week vacation with his family to Costa Rica. And he could have easily taken that time off from the project, you know, be with his family and take the vacation he deserved. Instead, what he did was uh, sat on his porch beachside in Costa Rica and zoomed into every one of our meetings. So he was fully committed to our project and the people that he was working with. Um, and we really couldn't thank him enough for that. So um, the impact that he had and our mentors had on our project was um, pretty invaluable to say the least. That's great, Alicia. Hey, with technology these days, if anybody wants to mentor, you can always zoom in beachside. I would highly recommend that. Um, Dechelle, you're a relatively, relatively a newcomer to our center. Um, you can imagine that when we're out there recruiting businesses to participate in a program like this, there is some skepticism about, you know, how can students actually help a company like mine? Um, but I try to put those to rest because I truly believe in the skill sets that our students and our mentors provide. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like for you working with students and your mentors? Um, well, honestly, my son is 25 years old. And so I thought, okay, I can't get advice from my son. But, <laughs> but how can I get advice from these students? But you know, I, you know what, I, I joined the program and they really, it, like I said, it was life-changing. These students were so passionate about helping me and seeing my business grow, you know, the advisors, mentors. Um, so they were just so excited. Every class, I said, you know what, I might be a little spaced out here and there, but please stay on top of me. Um, so I, I got to give credit to the students because they really pushed me through. They held me accountable and I owe them, you know, where I am now in the janitorial industry outside of the post-construction cleaning. It was these students who really buckled down and assisted me. And so, yeah. That's Definitely great. don't be skeptical. <laughs> these, these students can assist for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and Terry, we have time for more questions. So you can get the last one. Um, can you, can, you know, obviously this program, a program like this is a huge learning experience for our clients and our students, but what about business mentors? What are some of the things that you've sort of learned by participating in a program like this over the years? Well, thanks, Will. The interesting thing is uh, Bill Marshall and I were co-chairs for many, many years. Okay. Have better? Yes, you do. Sorry, guys. So Bill Marshall and I were co-chairs for many years uh, together, and we also worked uh, with many clients together as well. And what we came away from, we used to talk about how every year the student system seemed to get brighter and brighter. But what what I came away from 
why I continue to go back is the fact that irrespective of all the issues in the world, we um, the students, no matter what their culture for the team seem to work well together. And we always used to emphasize teamwork. And to I, I can't even think of one time that they did, did the whole this whole teamwork aspect didn't get get epitomized. And uh, we really that's what I came away from. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Terry. So before I, I hand this over to Ken for questions from the audience, I want to say thank you all for joining this panel. We really, really appreciate and um, and learned a lot from your stories. It's really inspiring and, and just know that we're here to continue the fight to help you grow. So thanks again. Ken, over to you. I got a question, hang on. What happened to your husband in that scenario? <laughs> He's now uh, participating in the consulting business program. So I encouraged him to uh, join the program. He's uh, a part of this year's. That's correct. Uh, yeah. But other than that, he's, he's, he's still struggling to, to let me go and do my own thing. I'm still involved in the business. He always will. Can I ask one more question of, this, of Alicia? Is it scary to have to work with adults? And this goes to all of them. I, I could never have done what you do. I would have piddled my pants. <laughs> I probably almost still would. That's an overshare. Sorry, Beth. Is it scary? I mean, yeah, I think scary is definitely an understatement. Um, it's interesting because I think the most rewarding and the most scary part of doing an experience like this are the exact same thing. Um, you, it's You're working with a real business and these are real people's lives and livelihoods and careers. And so that's a huge opportunity to have an impact, especially as just a group of undergraduate students. But at the same time, having that responsibility, especially knowing that many of the business owners are coming from underserved backgrounds, um, I, I think put a lot of pressure on us um, as a team. But I think that pressure really motivated us to want to put forward the best product forward so um it was definitely a positive source of motivation oh well i've got a oh i was just going to add that for the students the business owners were equally as nervous so just know that okay <laughs> well i have a question basically for alicia and for you too will um knowing that the university operates on a quarter system you know well, your businesses are not on a quarter system so is there a flexibility built into the classes that you've been taking so that you can expand the time frame beyond the 10 weeks that you're dealing with in a quarter? Do you mean um, kind of having a longer relationship with the same client or just that's, applying the same skills? That's right, no. Continuing the relationship with the client um, and making sure that you can continue to get credit Beyond one quarter, there needs to be that type of flexibility, a two quarter class, a year class. We do that in the law school all the time. Do you do it in the business school? Sure, uh, not from my personal experience, but I know some of my classmates and other students who've done the programs have um, found internships with the companies that they in, that they uh, did the program with. Um, from my end, not necessarily with the same client or the same program, but I had such a positive experience with the class over the winter that I actually came back as an intern over the summer, worked with three incredible minority-owned, women-owned businesses, um, and I'm now working as an assistant with the center. And so once you're kind of in the system, the staff really like to make a joke that you're always kind of part the family. Um, so I've been working with the, the CBDC since starting that program. Um, so there's definitely more opportunities to work not only with the center with a more um, extended period of time, but for some students, there is an opportunity to work with the client as well. And, and if I can add to that, John, so part of the beauty with working with Seattle Rotary is that our Rotarians not only help our students through that, that winter quarter process, but they actually meet with the businesses during fall to help sort of set up what that project is going to be during winter quarter. And then once the students develop their final recommendations, the mentors actually stay on with the clients during the spring quarter to help them implement those recommendations. And we highly encourage our clients to hire their students to help them implement that because who better to implement them than the ones that actually develop the recommendations, right? And we see a lot of these students actually maybe not get credit, but they do get cash, which is probably better for their perspective. So that continuation definitely happens. So, all right. I think that is it for us. Thanks again, everyone, for giving us the time. I appreciate it. And let's go for another 25 years. Thank you. Thank you.
Every year, I am so impressed by all of the participants. Uh, thank you, Will and Dechelle and Alicia and Terry. Really appreciate you being part of the, the program today and sharing your insights and, uh, and great stories of success. Now, in recognition of the generosity of your time, Will, and all of you, our club has contributed to Harvest Against Hunger, a nonprofit agency providing healthy meal components to food banks. And we've given 600 servings of healthy produce in your name. So thank you. Sarah and Ken, <clears throat> thank you for fielding questions. Uh, our club greatly benefits from the sponsorship of several members. And I'd like to express my gratitude to our gold sponsors, longtime Rotary supporter, Bob Alexander. Our other sponsors include Joel Farrell with Morgan Stanley, Dominic Musafia from Seattle Divorce Options, Jacobson Jarvis Certified Public Accountants, Matt Bratlin, NetTech Pro Bono IT Services, and for our tech support, Live Oak AV. Now, the voting polls have closed, and the results are in for your 2023-2024 board leadership. Here to announce the results is this year's nominations chair, Jan Levy. Jan? Thank you, President Beth. Um, it has been a privilege to do this work on behalf of your governance committee. And joining me in the effort, if, if you're here, were Nancy Cahill, uh, please stand, Jimmy Collins, Sue McNabb, uh, Nancy Osborne, I don't think is here, Jeff Parker, are you here? I haven't seen you. Dave Siebert and Mark Wright. So please join me in thanking our nominating committee. As you know, the bylaws call for the governance committee to present the slate of candidates and club officer for club officers, at-large board members, foundation trustees, uh, to all of you in writing two weeks prior to our annual meeting. And in case you didn't know it, this is our annual meeting. That notice was provided uh, in the to the club on January 18th, and it was sent out electronically as well. The voting has been open for two weeks. It closed Monday evening. There were a few paper ballots that we had to count that came in today for those who are technically challenged. Um, the voting is now closed, and I am thrilled to announce the results. Uh, you're at large, and if you're here, please stand, and we'll acknowledge you all at the end. Uh, you're at large club board members who have agreed to serve three year terms Tabitha Claus. Matt, Mike Hatzenbeller, Jennifer Hanstein, Liz Powell, and Niasha Tundawani. Just hang on, everybody. Uh, Rotary Service Foundation trustees elected to three year terms Eric Christensen, Tiffany Lewis, Sue McNabb, Francis Walker, stand up, Sue, and Lori Walker. Lori, I know you're here. I saw you. There you are. Okay. Club officers, President Nancy Cahill, immediate past president, Beth Knox, Mary Johnstone will be the board chair, vice president for programs, John Steckler, vice president for membership recruitment, Nick Anderson, Vice President for Membership Retention, Stephen Morse. Vice President for Service, Jaime Mendez. Secretary, Marsha Mutisi. Treasurer, Jeff Parker. Sergeant at Arms, Jen Gladish, with the great shoes. Check out her shoes, you guys. 
And once again, I'm so thrilled your chair, president elect is John Bridge. Please thank all of these folks for their willingness to serve. Seattle 4 is in good hands and I'm gonna pitch you one more time. If you have any interest in leadership, let one of us know. We don't know just by reading minds. So please tell us if you're interested in club leadership. Thank you all. Jan, thank you. It's such an important role that Jan served to, uh, to, to do this outreach and bring together a committee uh, so that we do end up with tremendous leadership. And I am so excited for next year's leadership. So thank you all for stepping up. Uh, all right, to close out our program, we have a few announcements from first Virginia McKenzie about a work party, and then co-VP of membership, John Steckler to share member engagement opportunities. And finally, our Prince of Programs, Ken Grant will share what speakers are scheduled in the coming weeks. Thank you, President Beth. Yes, we have a service project on Sunday, February 12th. That is Super Bowl Sunday. We are coming alongside We Heart Seattle, which is a nonprofit who clears trash from homeless encampments as a uh, way to, it's a harm reduction strategy for the people living there, as well as a beautification strategy for our city parks and greenways. Uh, the service project will take place on uh, near East Lake under Interstate 5 from 10 till noon. This project is uh, good for volunteers age 13 and older. RSVPs are being collected via Facebook, and I will be there. If you have any questions, you can ask me. There is a link in our newsletter. Hope to see you there. Thank you. Okay, Rotarians, I want you to get out right now. Get out and get engaged with some of your fellow Rotarians. We got some great events for you. Talked about the Seattle U uh, basketball game at the Climate Pledge Arena that's coming up here, what, on February 8th? Yes, we are going to have a private guided tour for those Rotarians who choose to go to this event. Thanks to President Beth. Thank you very much, President Beth. I've now just kind of sorted, but now we've really committed it to it, Beth. You got to do it. And the other one is the Taproot Theater uh, performance of A Woman of New Importance. These three dates, February 3rd, February 10th, and the matinee, uh, yeah, on Saturday, February 18th, have discounted tickets, half price tickets. This is a great theater, great show, got good reviews. Definitely want you to see that and get a, can't, have, can't ignore a night of Oscar Wilde, I got to tell you. And last, uh, the Seattle Opera is presenting A Thousand Splendid Sons. We have, pick a, t pick a seat anywhere you want for this show, and then afterwards, tell them you're part of Rotary they'll give you a 30% reduction. These are three great events. Get out, spend some time with your fellow Rotarians. That's what makes Seattle Force so special. Thank you. Oh, yep, here comes the Prince of Programs. Looks like he's piddling his pants to get up here. So come on up again. Really? What, what is the, I swear to God, five more months, people, just five more stinking months. Uh, and I'm going to go with, I bet you there's not a club in the world that would allow somebody to use the word fiddle, except for this club. That makes this very cool. All right. So when I was a little kid, I was used to go to the Y to uh, work out. Anybody else been influenced? Mark, stop laughing. Anybody else been influenced in, the, in their lives by the Y? Yeah, that's true. So next week, we've got the head of the Y coming along, and I'm going to tell her my stories because I used to get so nervous. Same, that's funny. There's a theme going on. Uh, we're also going to hear from our very own education committee next week. Also, the week after that is the head of uh, Columbia Hospitality uh, with a conversation with our very own Mark Wright. I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be very cool. Uh, David Babanik is not here. Uh, he's going to be speaking about um, his huge, big upcoming event, uh, Hearts and Wine. I like this little monitor. Anybody else? Anything else coming up? Oh, our very own Linda Black, uh, Linda Thompson Black is going to have a chat with us about 
kids getting into college, which doesn't sound as easy as it probably should. Was that a riddle just then? And oh, that was my boat. Oh, and then back, we're going to have a conversation with uh, the Saddle Rotary Mariners. And then the week after that, am I just making you guys go crazy back there? So, you know, you know, uh, Gerilyn Brousseau, you know how she's been with our club for so long and every story I've ever heard from her was always about her um, trees in Vietnam. I have begged and pled and begged and pled more that she's going to finally tell her story of inventing the Cinnabon. And then we're going to hear from our very own Dorothy Bull of the week after about leadership, four generations of family leadership in Seattle. There's a, these, these, you got a high bar to like get across there, my friend. Uh, thank you, Will. Thank you, guests. Thank you, students. Uh, thank you, Jaime. And congratulations on becoming the star of the day. I love it. All right, back to you, Beth. Thank you, Virginia, John, and Prince. <laughs> now, for our guest today, my day job is leading the Seattle Sports Commission. So at the end of each of our Rotary meetings, I like to wrap up with a few highlights from our Seattle sports teams. Now, as we all know, where some of our sports teams are, are uh, in off season, but uh, I want to share a few things because sports are a great conversation topic, and uh, it's it's nice to have a few fun facts to take to the water cooler or uh, dinner dinner table this week. So last Friday, now I know Will and all of our students know this. <clears throat> last Friday, the University of Washington men's track coach coach orchestrated something very special. He brought together eight runners for an invitational at Dempsey Indoor Center, where all eight of them ran the mile in under four minutes. Now, it's been nearly 70 years since Roger Bannister broke this barrier, and only 16 Husky runners previously had run this race in under four minutes. So to have eight racers do so in one race with times that shot to the top of the college rankings is almost unimaginable. So pretty impressive. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, in less than two weeks, the Kansas City Chiefs and Philadelphia Eagles will play in Super Bowl 57. Now, while our Seahawks won't be there, five players from area universities in our own area will be playing in the, the Super Bowl. Three are from Washington State University, one from Washington, and another from Idaho. Now, the Seattle Kraken, are, uh, they enter the All Star break in first place in the Pacific Division. We're very excited about that. The uh, rookie, Maddie Beneers, was chosen to play in the All-Star game, but unfortunately will miss it after an injury during the Kraken's win over Vancouver last week. And the Sounders will make history on Saturday as the first MLS team in the FIFA Club World Cup in Morocco. Local fans can cheer on the, on the rave green at the Seattle Armory at 9 a.m. this Saturday. And the quote I'll leave you with today is from women's, women's soccer legend, Mia Hamm. She said, my coach said I run like a girl. And I said, if he ran a little faster, he could too. We are adjourned.